death drive is not biological, as Lacan, Lacanians insist, how are we to understand it? In the previous talk, we were stressing that death drive is very much about certain forms of traumatic repetition, things that seem to impress themselves upon us again and again, but we also emphasized this paradoxical notion that even though the traumatic things, the, the, the repetitions may seem to impress themselves upon us, you could also say that the subject has some kind of agentic role in these repetitions. This is one of Freud's big puzzles. It's also why, in part at least, Lacan's going to say that repetition is one of the four fundamental crucial concepts in psychoanalysis. So we're going to try and respond to that question. How to think death drive outside the parameters of the biological with two different responses. The first response you could say is more Zizekian than Lacanian in some respects, but I think it still works. I think it still is faithful to a kind of Lacanian conceptualization. And that is going to suggest that the death drive is something which fundamentally disconnects us from nature. So we'll speak about that and then we will also take a, a citation from Lacan and talk about repetition, understood as repetition automatism. And what we mean by that is crucial Lacanian idea that repetition as it affects the human psyche is repetition as linked to as uh, fundamentally reliant upon the symbolic, upon language, linguistic phenomena, which mean that repetition in humans, repetition of a distinctively human form is symbolic in nature. And you can see why this is so crucial, because it'll enable him, at least he'll attempt in this way, to pull the whole notion of death drive away from a kind of natural organic formulation into something which is precisely there because the human speaking subject is, as it were, subordinated, subjected to, inundated by language, by operations that are symbolic in nature. So what is the Zizekian move here? The Zizekian move, and again, I think it is faithful to, to Lacan, is to say that there's something radical about death drive. And in, um, in my research for these talks, you know, you'll find death drive mentioned virtually in every other or every major of Zizek's work. So he's kind of preoccupied with it as well. And he gives it a certain agentic role. And you could even say that this is a kind of meta-agentic role. What do I mean by that? Well, he walks us through it in these ways. He says that to be a human being is no longer to be merely a natural entity. What do you mean by that? Well, what he means by that, and this is Lacanian, as Lacanian can be, is that animals are, in many ways, uh, their operating system is instinct, you could say. They're instinctually endowed, and that's a way that enables them to be in the world, which is relatively successful, one could hope. Human beings, though, seem to constantly sidestep instincts. They go beyond their instincts. They break their instincts. They are motivated to do things which are not in their best interests. Maybe that's the most simple way of putting it. And in as much as humans are motivated to do things that aren't in their best interests, they bypass any number of instinctual values or ideas. In fact, you could say that human beings have a pursuit of unhappiness rather than a pursuit of happiness or their pursuit of a certain type of enjoyment invariably takes them beyond what is reasonable what is rational we've discussed this before in the lectures on jouissance now if that's the case Zizek wants to argue that self-relating negativity which is a concept obviously that he takes from Hegel self-relating negativity is one way of thinking the Freudian notion of death drive but maybe we've got to take a step back he gives two nice characterizations of death drive. One is to say that it's a kind of radical negativity. The other is it's exactly that thing which upsets animal homeostasis. The death drive is that thing which uh, is, introduces an antagonism, a kind of split, a kind of rupture, a kind of negativity into the life of human beings. So let's, let's take a couple of quotes. And what was rather fun about preparing all of this was to do a big montage of all the moments where Zizek tries to describe the, the death drive. So, in The Sublime Object of Ideology, he makes this assertion. We have to, he says, abstract Freud's biologism. The death drive is the dimension of radical negativity. It's not a biological fact. It is the traumatic kernel, a radical antagonism 
through which man cuts his umbilical cord with nature, with animal homeostasis. I've put uh, a little paraphrase of that on there, so you could see it's from the sublime object of ideology, right at the opening of that book. And it's a rather dramatic turn of phrase, but I think it serves us well here. Death drive is a kind of radical antagonism. It's that through which human beings cut their umbilical cord with nature, with animal homeostasis. He will go on in subsequent passages to say death drive is something akin to a mediator between the state of nature and the state of culture. And actually, in these descriptions, he sounds quite close to Freud, for Freud would often make this, this uh, would locate human subjectivity as awkwardly in between, split between one foot in nature, one foot in culture. Uh, this kind of non-remediable, non-reconcilable splitness of the human subject, who's by definition, at the, as it were, the real epicenter of this kind of conflictual relation. So in that sense, you could say that Zizek is being a good Freudian there. So here's the next, um, the next nice quote where he also develops on this point. And he gives it to us in the form of a question. How do we human beings pass from a state of animal sexuality, the state of instinctual coupling, to properly human sexuality? His answer, by submitting animal sexuality to the death drive. The death drive is the transcendental form which makes human sexuality proper out of animal instincts. Now, we don't need to get overly complicated here, but just let's make that basic point. You could say, if you take three steps back and look at human subjectivity in its various enjoying forms and how it is separate from animal subjectivity, if we could even call it animal subjectivity, the reason human sexuality is not merely instinctual coupling is that it's been pulled out of the domain of instincts and it practices itself in a range, in a variety of ways, in a sometimes uh, um, uh, in modes of enjoying which are not fundamentally of the parameters of instinct. This movement then of the human subject from a state of instinctual cultural existence to something else is what he's trying to explain. And for him, the mediator, the necessary middle step in doing that is what he calls death drive. It's got a nice uh, quote here where he puts it in these terms. The passage from nature to culture is not direct. Something has to intervene between nature and culture. A kind of vanishing mediator, which is neither nature nor culture. This in-between is silently presupposed in all evolutionary narratives. The Freudian name for this in-between, this vanishing mediator, is of course the death drive. Now we'll come back to that, but I just want to emphasize two elements. Here, death drive seems to be the thing that sets us off kilter, puts us off balance. But oddly, and I think here the Lacanian conceptualization really does add something, despite that it's understood as radical negativity, uh, dis disabling some kind of instinctual endowment as, as, as antagonism, despite all of these things, and you could say, ultimately, it's not in our best interest. It puts us on a trajectory towards some kind of self-damaging uh, 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 um, arrival. Despite all of that, you could say that there's some agency, some tremendously important human agentic ability which comes with the name Death Drive. So I want to keep that in play. We'll return to it and we'll have opportunities to use uh, Zizek's Hegelian vocabulary, self-relating negativity, the constitutive gap, all of these ideas, radical negativity, to try and animate this concept, to try and make it more straightforward. But the crucial idea here is that death drive brings with it a crucial form of human agency. We are no longer simply natural entities. We are no longer simply uh, confined to instinctual uh, ways of being in the world. Death drive, then, is a kind of agency. You could say maybe it's a terrible agency, but it is an agency nevertheless. It's a formidable agency that moves us from the state of nature into the state of culture. So that's one set of more philosophical responses to why death drive is not biological. It's not biological because it's precisely the thing that strikes a distance between us and biology, the natural instinctual world. Let's then say a few things about Lacan. And what we're going to do is connect to where we left off last time. And there we were talking about repetition compulsion. The question I asked, why does Lacan not talk about repetition compulsion? Well, 
in the 1950s, and certainly as his career goes on, Lacan is very clear that he wants himself to strike a certain critical distance. He doesn't like thinking of psychoanalysis as a type of psychology, and he doesn't like thinking about psychoanalytic concepts in a way that could be reduced to psychical or psychological conceptualizations. What do you mean by that, Derek? Well, what I mean is, in the 1950s particularly, he wants to be able to see how various Freudian concepts are sustained by, made possible by, are animated through linguistic processes. So rather than say repetition compulsion, compulsion here seemingly anchoring this phenomena in a, some kind of psychological human subjectivity, he prefers repetition automatism. Because repetition automatism is going to say that the most important, formidable forms of human repetition have that automatism of a machinic-like movement, a machinic-like momentum of language itself. Now, in a series of earlier lectures, we did a lot of work trying to show how there is momentum in the symbolic. How to speak sets in a certain place, a momentum of the signifier, all of these things. So we're not going to go back to all of that, but just to make that point again, the most crucial element of repetition, and to take a step back, remember we said that early Lacan, or 50s Lacan, engaging with death drive, wants to foreground the symbolic dimension. And maybe, just while we're there, we could ask this question. Does repetition happen in the animal world? Does repetition happen merely in the natural domain? Thinking about it now, I suppose, well, the seasons come again, you know, you've got these kinds of repetition. But presumably, Lacan's answer would be the distinctively form of psychical repetition that we see in the lives, the self-sabotaging patterns we see in the lives of people who come to the clinic. The, the, the repetitions that have a traumatic potential, they seem to be somehow properly human not merely natural. And I suppose here the, the, the question that I'm throwing out at you is, the proper human dimension of repetition for Lacan seems to be symbolic. So my question, said in a kind of polemical, provocative way is, or maybe it's an assertion rather than a question, the repetition of which Lacan is speaking about doesn't seem to happen in animals. It doesn't seem to happen in nature in the way that it does for human beings are haunted by the repetitions of language itself, of signifiers. So the most obvious example of that, and I know right now you're saying, give us an example, it's getting all very philosophical. Lacan's always a good reader of Freud, and he goes, let's think about some of the key examples that Freud gives us in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And of course, one of those is the one, I've already mentioned it, is the Fort Dar game. Freud's grandson dealing with his mother not being there, feeling a little bit upset about that, does this rudimentary symbolized game where there is a reel, throws it away, Fort Dar says certain words, seeming to reenact the loss, pulling it back, reenacting the loss again and again. And Freud notes, isn't it interesting that he, he puts these two signifiers to it, Fort Dar, that there's a kind of signifying dimension to the repetition. And I suppose you could say in Lacanian terms, that's not just signifying a loss, but something about the signifying process is also driving the repetition, one could argue. Nevertheless, those are some of the crucial points that we wanted to, to touch on. And what I want to do is just do a little bit of a paraphrase from uh, Lacan's seminar on the Purloin letter. Now, of course, reading Lacan is always going to end up in like, uh, so you know the book, obviously, it's Lacan's Ecree. Uh, we're on page 33 and 34. Reading Lacan directly always just, you know, results in lack of clarity. But let's just see if we can pull out a couple of concepts and words that may connect to some of what we've said so far. At the bottom of page 33, Seminar on the Purloin Letter, right in the introduction of the essay, Lacan says, Repetition automatism. Although the notion is presented in the book in question, okay, he's referring back to Freud's work, uh, is referring to beyond the pleasure principle. It's designed to respond to certain paradoxes in clinical work, like the dreams found in traumatic neurosis and the negative therapeutic reaction. Okay, these are all things we've spoken about. He's foregrounding the importance of repetition automatism, smuggling in his own word, repetition automatism rather than repetition compulsion. 
He says these things, okay, the repetition of traumas, the, the negative therapeutic reaction, those moments when the, the patient seems to poison their own clinical work, just when they're at the very moment of starting to improve, these cannot be conceived as an add-on to the doctrinal edifice of psychoanalysis. So these are the peripheral concepts. These are right at the core, are crucial to the clinical work. In Freud's project, he already presents us with this dilemma of the subjects trying to refine an object that's been fundamentally lost. Then he continues. Freud is concerned with a certain form of repetition. He takes the decisive step of thinking repetition in his work within human agents. He says this repetition is most fundamentally a symbolic form of repetition. And it turns out that the symbolics order can no longer be conceived as there, as constituted by man, but must rather be conceived as constituting him. So translated into more fundamentally easy, accessible terms, if we want to understand the fundamentally human dimensions of repetition, we need to think about how that is enabled through symbolic processes, practices, through language. And it's not the case that we simply are uh, the makers of language. Rather, we as human subjects and human subjects of an unconscious are, as it were, determined, produced by those linguistic processes. Last little point here. Freud does not compromise regarding the original quality of his experience that we see him constrained to evoke therein an element that governs it from beyond life, an element he calls death instinct. And then he comments a little bit on, on the fourth dog game. So what are we saying then? Let's draw to a conclusion. We're saying that Lacan thinks repetition is an absolutely fundamental psychoanalytic concept and it applies very much to those type of moments where Freud wants to think about the death drive operating. Lacan thinks, well, yeah, we need this concept, we need to engage with this type of clinical work, but it seems to him that the most human, crucial human elements of repetition are about being locked into the symbolic, about how the symbolic does its work on us, about how certain forms of repetition are ensured because we are, and maybe this is where we'll end, to get a sense of where it's coming from, to be a human subject, which is to be a speaking subject, is as it were to be thrown into a domain where language overspeaks us, overlays us, speaks through us, brings a certain kind of momentum to it. And remember also, in, in Lacan's ideas on clinical work, it's never simply a focus on the agency of the ego, on what the subject views as their own agency. It's always an attention to the agency of the symbolic processes that overspeak them. And if that's the case, then those traumatic moments of repetition that uh, emerge in the life of the subject, and even in the smallest kinds of moments of self-sabotaging acts, which we see all over the place in clinical work, those things are to be understood within the remit of the operation of language, the signifier and symbolic relations. Let's end there.